Praise the Lord, everybody. Did anybody come to bless the Lord on tonight? Why don't you stand to your feet and let's give God a praise in this place. Hallelujah, Jesus. We bless your holy name. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. We give you all the praise. Somebody lift up your voice unto God in this place. Hallelujah. We bless your name, Jesus. You're worthy. Come on with the fruit of your lips. Give him the glory. Lift up Jesus in this place. Hallelujah. We bless you, Jesus. Well, come on, let's continue to worship and praise him. Hallelujah. You're worthy, Jesus. Hallelujah to your name, God. We bless your name, Jesus. You're a wonderful God. You're a mighty God. You're a great king. You're a great ruler. We give you the glory tonight. We come to bless you, Jesus. You're worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Put your hands together.
victory. If you know that you win, come on, if you know that you win, celebrate your victory. you're going through, no matter what the difficulty, we win in the end. Praise God. Amen. We're going to go into a season of prayer this evening. We're going to invite the elders to come prepare the oil. Amen. And anybody that has a need in this house, we're going to ask God to supply every need in abundance. The Bible says that he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. I don't know about you, but I've got a pretty big imagination. But God can exceed that. God can go above and beyond anything that we can ask of him. Amen. We want to continue to pray for Brother Peter. Amen. Vietnam, his father passed away. We want to ask God's hand upon this situation. Amen. Ask God's peace and comfort. And any other needs, if you have a need, make it known to the Lord with a lifted hand. We know a God who is able to supply every need that's represented in this house. Amen. We invite you to come. If you have a sickness in your body, if you want to stand in the gap for somebody, we invite you to come to the altar this evening. The elders will anoint you with oil. We're going to believe God to supply your need to make you whole and to heal your body. Amen. Come on, church. Let's lift up our voices and let's take these needs before the Lord tonight. Lord, I thank you, God, for your touch, for your healing, for your hand upon each of these needs, every Situation, God, you know every person who would be here tonight, and you know the needs that are represented in this house. We give them into your hands, God. We ask, God, that you would heal and that you would restore and strengthen in every situation. God, we ask that you would lay your hand upon Brother Peter, God, and upon their family, Lord. We're asking that your touch would be upon their lives, that your comfort and your peace would be extended unto them, Lord God. We give it into your hands. We know that you work all things together for good to those who love you and to those who are the called according to your purpose. God, we thank you for it today. We praise you for healing. Can we just thank him all over this house? Can we just give him a hand clap of praise and thanksgiving all over this house tonight? All over this house, let's lift our hands and continue. Continue to worship the Lord right now. We worship you, Jesus. We praise your name, God. We come to exalt you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, make yourself known in this house tonight, Jesus. Let your glory flow.
praise you in advance, oh God. We're taking the limits off of you tonight. We're anticipating a moving of your spirit in this place tonight, Jesus. with us as we lift up the name of Jesus. He is going to do the miraculous in this house tonight. I believe you for it, Jesus. You said
I receive the word of the Lord tonight. You said, I believe it. If you said, then it is done. You said, I believe. If you said, then it is done. Let's lift up the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I will enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise tonight, Jesus. I will rejoice, for this is the day that you have made. You've given me another reason to love you, Jesus. You've given me another reason to thank you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. That's how easy it is. Why don't you join me? I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. No more. You, Jesus. Oh, you're the King of Kings. You're the Lord of Lords. There is nothing too small that you do not see, God. There is nothing too great that you cannot handle, Jesus. I will rejoice. Let's take time. We love you, Jesus. We worship you, God. I believe you're going to do it, Jesus. I believe your word. I believe what you said, God. Come on, speak it out in faith right now. The Holy Ghost is here. Jesus is moving. I claim it in Jesus' name. I'm standing on your word of promise, God. I'm standing on what you said. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Oh, we love you, mighty God. We love you. Welcome to the house of the Lord on a wonderful Tuesday evening. We are absolutely delighted to have you here. We have just one announcement this evening. Please remember, if you have been sent a text message about the Passing the Torch tag-in, which will be tomorrow evening, please remember that. It is tomorrow evening at 7 p.m., Right next door, food will be provided. So if you received a text, if you didn't get a text, don't worry about it. If you received a text, please make sure that you're at that meeting. Also, if you are a Sunday school teacher, there is still a Sunday school meeting at 6 p.m. We will get that done and out of the way. And then those of us that need to go into the Pass the Torch meeting can do so. Now, with all the announcements out of the way, why don't you step out in the aisle, find somebody that you haven't had a chance to greet yet, Why don't we greet each other in Jesus' name?
put your hands together. Oh, come on. I think we can do better than that on a Tuesday night. Is anybody blessed in the house tonight? God woke us up this morning. As several songs say, he started us on our way. And he didn't have to do that this morning. And I am so very grateful that God chose to wake me up and keep me in my right mind and get me through the day. Is anybody else thankful what God has done for us this week? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We are going to move into the tithing and offering portion of the service. If you would put our memory verse upon the screen, why don't we read this all together? But the land, whether ye go to possess it, is a land of hills and valleys, and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. If you believe that, would you bring your tithing and your offering with faith in your heart tonight?
five people and say, yes, I want the fire. Some of y'all ain't doing it. High five five people and say, yes, I want the fire. Why don't you clap your hands and shout out to God with the voice of triumph as you return back to your seats. Come on, shout out to God with the voice of triumph in this place. Hallelujah. Amen. How many are ready to hear the preaching of the word tonight? Amen. How many are ready to hear the preaching of the word tonight? Amen. If you're ready to hear the preaching of the word, why don't you lift up your hands and lift up your voice and ask God to speak to your heart as Bishop comes to preach the word of the Lord. Come on, I think we can fill this place with our praise tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Part of revival is lifting up our voices. The Bible says, cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah. I thank God for the wonderful worship and music that God has given us in this church. But I also thank God for people that know how to pray. You can't have revival without prayer. Thank you for those five people that believe that. You said you can't have revival without prayer. And Jesus said there were particular strongholds and demons and generational curses that the only way they came out was by prayer and by fasting. Praise God. And so I'm so grateful to God for the anointing of the Lord that I feel here tonight. I'm also delighted to have all of our guests and our visitors with us. Amen. We love our guests and our visitors. Praise God. And uh, we're so thrilled tonight to have Olivia with us. God bless you, Olivia. So glad that you could be with us. And uh, we got some of our people from our northern church. Brother Caleb's here tonight. So glad he's come to be with us. I love this young man very, very much. And I love his spirit. I love his devotion to truth. I love his spirit of excellence, the discipline that he has in his life. And uh, I, we need young men like this young man as examples to the youth of our generation. Praise God. And uh, so glad he could be with us tonight. You know, uh, I was really... <laughs> I've, I've been feeling this for like three or four days now. And I have this whole series of notes and I couldn't find them. So I'm, I'm scrambling to find them on our website because I know they're there. But I'm in the old program that does not do PDF file. So I gotta go page by page, but I'm getting close. I am about seven pages away. So uh, here we go, right here. Nope. Anyway. Praise God. Well, why don't you lift your hands and worship the Lord? He's a great God.
text, I'm going to need your help. This is not saying the right thing. Can you come up here or maybe Nana Ray get in our uh, the app? song that's on my mind. I don't even know if Brother Richard knows it. I'd need help. You know, we were we were talking about uh, the, the first song that we did tonight was uh, well, the second song, Sister Melody, Believe For It. And while she was singing that, the song came to my mind, Standing on the Promises of God My King through the eternal ages let his praises ring glory unto something in the highest I will shout and sing standing on the promises of God is anybody standing on the promises of God when I was a little boy I'd, I'd just open my mouth and I'd sing standing 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 on the promises of God my Savior standing I'm standing and all the old timers they would hold it out forever I'm standing till you turn purple Standing on the promise. Is anybody still standing on the promises of God? I know a lot of people that have slipped away. But thank God for people that say, God, you made me a promise. And I'm going to be here when it comes to pass. I'm going to be standing right here. Oh, let's clap our hands and praise him. You feel the Holy Ghost tonight? Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Brother Hicks and Brother Mitchell. I, I've been praying for a couple of days, and I said, God, what are you doing? Because normally the lesson that I'm going to give tonight is the lesson that we give in February in our stewardship. But I felt the unctioning of the Holy Ghost all day. If you have your Bibles, go to Hebrews. Uh, is it Hebrews chapter where it talks about therefore leaving the principles of the faith? Is that chapter 6? Hebrews chapter 6. I, I, want, I want you to see something here. In Hebrews, how many of you love the Word of God? I'm going to tell you something. I was talking with Brother Booker last night, and he said, how in the world are Brother and Sister Westbrook? And I said, well, they're doing good. In fact, Brother Westbrook preached here a couple of weeks ago, and I saw some of it online, and it was wonderful. That anointing is still there. And I hope when I get to be 88 years old, I can preach like that. Jesus' name. And we got to talking about faithfulness. And, and, and some of us, if we can catch this revelation of faithfulness, you're going to see some amazing things in your life if you learn how to be faithful. Praise God. And so it says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, the doctrine, excuse me, of Christ. Let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Now, there are people that try to do away with that, but uh, many people would maybe not agree with me, but I feel like the Apostle Paul wrote this. And he is making it a very strong point that 
we're not discounting these foundations and these doctrines. We are building on them as we progress higher and higher. So the point of this lesson and many lessons to come to you wonderful saints of God, especially we have young people that are coming in and we have new converts that are coming in. I know it's a slim crowd tonight, but I learned a long time ago, let Jesus worry about the crowd. It's his church, it's not mine. Now, if you're playing hooky and you're watching online, you caught, you caught. The Lord caught you, you need to be here. But if you've got a valid reason, we understand. But I'm going to tell you something. Just watching church online is not a valid reason. I'm going to say that again. Just watching church online is not a valid reason to miss church. But if you're sick or out of town or whatever, we understand. Vacation. But... If you can catch this, because we're, we have a lot of new converts and a lot of young people. And if, if these kids can get this, these foundations in their life now. And get these foundations in their life now. When they uh, get on later in life, they won't struggle like some struggle. So... I want to deal with one of those, but before I do that, I want you to know that uh, DJ is home. He's back in Pueblo. He's not in the hospital. He's home. I'm thanking God for that, but I'll tell you, we need some people that will go disciple him. Don't let him fall by the wayside. Don't let, let me tell you something. His drug pusher friends are not one bit afraid to hang out with him and disciple him. People of the world are not one bit ashamed to hang out with him and disciple him. I hope that this church will catch that revelation and say, okay, God, you're going to bring those people to us and you're going to heal them and you're going to do miracles like that. I don't want to just talk about it in the past. I want him sitting on a pew as a testimony of God's power and his grace. Amen. Praise God. Well, I didn't get as many shouts and hand claps on that one, but that's good preaching, Brother Elder. We're very grateful to God for what he's done. Praise God. I want to go to Malachi chapter. No, I don't want to go there yet. I want to go, and you're going to have to find, who's up there tonight? Man, I am making you all work tonight. Isn't it crazy? I got a degree, and I can't get this technological stuff to work. Uh, I want to go to Genesis, where the Bible says that Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. And I am not going to venture what chapter in Genesis that is but I know this is right after the battle that Abraham had with Chedorlaomer and the five kings that allied with him and and uh, no it's not in Hebrews <laughs> praise God hallelujah there we go Go, up, go back to verse 19, please. Genesis 14 and 19. And he, this personal pronoun in reference to Melchizedek, blessed him, personal pronoun Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. Look at that. If you have a highlighter, highlight hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. Because this promise was made clear back in Genesis. And God is keeping it clear over in Malachi. He delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he, personal pronoun in reference to Abraham, gave him, Melchizedek, tithes 
of all. Not, not a portion. Not just a little part. He said, well, I pay tithes on my income. No, you're supposed to pay tithes on your increase. You sell a house and you make money on it, you pay tithes. You sell a car and you make money on it, you pay tithes. You sell tomatoes out of your garden, make money on them, pay your tithes. Actually, you can't pay your tithes. You have to bring your tithe. But here, Abraham paid tithe of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, etc., etc. We can preach about that later. He tried to bless him too, but the king of Sodom didn't have the power to bless him like God had the power to bless him. Now let's go to Malachi chapter 3. And let's begin at verse number 8. Malachi, the third chapter, verse number 8, begins with a rhetorical question. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, even this whole... But you say, excuse me, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Tithes and offerings. Now, some people will try to tell you that that's the same thing. That is not. In the, in the Hebrew here, there are two different words. Tithing. We'll talk about that word here in a minute. And offering. And so, then the Bible says, God says, you're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now, some people think that God is pronouncing a curse on these people. No. Them disobeying the word of God has brought this curse upon them. He, he didn't curse them. Their, their actions and their behavior have cursed them. Okay, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of the Lord. No, you're tempted because you want to do what you want to do. Whenever man is tempted, he's drawn away of his own lust. He feeds his own appetite. And so you reap the reward of that appetite. Then he goes on and says, Bring ye all the tithes unto the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. Prove me now here with saith the Lord of hosts. Prove me. Did you know this is the only place I can find in the Bible where God said, Put me to the test. Prove me if I won't do this. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And then remember how Melchizedek told Abraham, you know, Abraham only had 300 men and he whipped Chedorlaomer and five kings and their whole army with 300 men. Do you think he did that of his own? No. Melchizedek said, the Lord hath given thine enemies into thy hand. Look at this. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. God said, if you'll do this, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations, that means all ethnicities, white, black, pink, purple, yellow, you name it, educated, ignorant, rich, poor, all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, how many of you believe the word of God? If you believe the word of God, why don't you put your Bible down and let's, let's just worship him and let's thank him for his word. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for the promise of your word. Hallelujah. You may be seated. In Genesis chapter 14, where I read to you tonight, uh, and in conjunction with Hebrews chapter 7, in fact, let's look at this Hebrews chapter 7, verse number 2. Through four, because Hebrews 7 talks about Melchizedek. 
In Hebrews chapter 7, verse number 2, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part. Now, why are you doing this, Brother Elder? Because I want to show you how much a tithe is. Because the Bible, the Old Testament says that he paid him tithe of all. And it's the Hebrew word masra, which means one-tenth. A tenth is what the word means. And so the New Testament, in fact, verifies this when it talks about Abraham giving a tenth part of all. First by being interpretation king of righteousness and after that also the king of Salem, which is also the king of peace. Verse number three, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the son of God, abideth a priest continually. Okay, highlight that. Because the devil has false doctrines about your tithing. We'll talk a little bit about that, okay? Now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham again gave a tenth of the spoils. All right? So we have, we have the definition of, of what tithing is that is laid out very clearly in the Bible. So we have uh, the, the Greek word dekados, which means tenth. The, the Hebrew word masra, which means a tenth. And then we have the old English term that we use today, the tithe, which means the tenth, okay? So what is tithing? Some would say, well, it's a tax that God puts on his people. No, tithing is not a tax. God never taxed his people. Tithing is born out of faith. The first place that we read about the word tithing is right here in Genesis chapter 14. But we read about the first fruits of God clear back in Genesis. And that's the difference between God accepting the offering of Abel and rejecting the offering of Cain. The Bible says that Abel brought unto the Lord the first fruits. And the Bible just simply says that Cain brought an offering to the Lord. So this is really, really important that we catch this, that this... This is more than just uh, what people would term as a taxation. A taxation is, is forced upon you. You don't have a choice. If you don't pay your taxes here in America, you are going straight to jail. Straight to jail. Straight to jail. Anybody seen that video? Straight to jail. You're not passing go. You're not collecting $200. Straight to jail. Because you don't have a choice in that. In the Bible, you have a choice about everything. You can go to hell if you want to. Nobody's going to make you go to heaven. And, you know, and, and you know, people say, well, you go down there, they'll just scare you to death. Look, brothers and sisters, if I could scare people into heaven, this would be, a, this would be the scariest show in town. And you might gripe and complain about it now, but once you got to heaven, you thank God every day that I scared the bejeebers out of you and you've made it to heaven. But ultimately, you have to fall in love with the things of God because the fear tactics will only work so much. And in this day and age, I don't know how much they'll work because so many people are already living in, a, in such terrible situations that that they're not much afraid of anything anymore. They're, they're, they've been desensitized by the hardness of life in their lives. So uh, it's not a tax. It is a connection. Mathematically, tithing is a tenth. We already read that, Genesis 28, 22. Uh, this is where Jacob meets God at, at, the, at the place of Bethel. Puts a stone there and he said, This stone which I have set before thee shall be, uh, shall be a pillar. This is God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto me. I didn't quote that exactly, but I quoted it pretty close. Because when I was, when I was these young men's age, these guys that are drawing pictures of army men, because I did that too when I was in 
their age. What is the, the, the attraction that little boys have of army men? Thank God he's not drawing Barbie dolls. I can't get a smile out of some of you to save my neck tonight. But when I was a little bit older, are you 15 yet, boo-boo? Pardon me, he's Corbin. But he'll always be boo-boo to me. Uh, I started memorizing the scripture uh, because I wanted... I wanted to make sure that I was accurate in the word of the Lord. And so this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. And so we see that mathematically it's a tenth. Scripturally, it's the law of God. Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse number 6 tells us, Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse number 6. And thither ye shall bring your burnt offerings. That is the Hebrew word holocaust. For some of you that don't know what that is. That's where the word holocaust comes from out of the Bible. You shall bring your holocaust, your burnt offerings, and your sacrifices, and your tithes. Mashra. Here it is again. And your heave offerings of your hand, and your vows, and your freewill offerings, and the firstlings of your herds, and of your flocks. So we see mathematically here, or scripturally, it is the law of God. Again, in, in, in Deuteronomy 14 and 22, the Bible reiterates this. Thou shalt truly tithe of all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. This was an agricultural people, and we'll talk about this here later on in this lesson tonight. But they didn't always have money like you and I. They lived off of a barter system. They said, well, I'll trade you five chickens for your cow. And you say, no, that's not enough. I need 25 chickens for this cow. This cow really lays good at... No, I mean this cow really gives good milk. Get that straightened out here. We don't have transgenderism among all the animals around here. I'm trying to make this lesson interesting for you tonight. Scripturally, it's the law. Morally, it's a debt. Malachi 3 and 8. Matthew 23 and 23, Jesus said, you pay tithe of uh, mint and eyes and coming. I think that's the three ones. And have omitted the weightier matters of the law, justice, uh, Judgment, excuse me, mercy and faith. These ought ye to have done and not left the other undone. So it is part of the moral structure of the law of God. And people that are really sincere about living for God are sincere about obeying the morality of Christianity and tithing and offering is part of that. Economically, it's an investment. Matthew 6 and 20, lay not up treasures here on the earth where it can be eaten by moth and rust and, and all of that. Am I quoting it right? Is that the right scripture there? But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through it and steal. I'm going to tell you this. I will be 60 years old this October. My wife said, do you want a big party? I said, no, I want a morning. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I don't care. If you want to throw a party, let's party. I love to party. I don't have to be 60 to party. Let's just party after church tonight, I, just for the sake of partying. But uh, let me tell you this, brothers and sisters. I learned this lesson when I was a 10-year-old kid. And the I am saying this unequivocally, unabashedly, unashamedly. Without embarrassment, without any reservation, I am telling you the greatest investment I have ever made in my life is in the kingdom of God. Amen. Flat, period. Amen. With my time, with my talent, and with my money, 
and with my family. And I have lived a life that most people only dream about living. Don't tell me that it's a huge sacrifice to obey the word of God. It's a worship, brothers and sisters. It might be a sacrifice to you, but let me say it like Abraham said it when he was going up to Mount Moriah. I and the lad will go yonder and worship. It's not just a sacrifice to me, it's worship. It's a lifestyle that's worth living, brothers and sisters. It's the best thing that God ever did in my life. Gave me the opportunity to return back into his kingdom. Economically, it's an investment. Spiritually, it's a blessing. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 10 or 11. I'm quoting, and I already quoted it, but you know that's how you teach is by redundance. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Praise God. So, seeing these things, we recognize this is a beautiful thing to obey the word of God in this area. Now, we know that tithing originated clear back, actually in Genesis, with Cain and Abel. That's where tithing began. Why is it, is, why is it important that we see this? Because one of the false doctrines that Satan will float in this world today is that tithing is a part of the law. Well, tithing was a part of the law, but tithing was instituted long before the law ever came into being. And tithing is not a part of the law. What three things are required for salvation in any dispensation? Somebody help me out here. Well, some of you did your homework. You hope core people ought to know this. Faith, blood, and obedience. No matter what dispensation you're in. We are not, we are not Baptist dispensationalists. We don't believe that each dispensation has its own method of salvation. There's only one method of salvation. And that is to go through the blood of Jesus Christ. And repent of your sins and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So well, they didn't have that in the Old Testament. I know, because God had not manifest himself in the flesh. So they had a substitute sacrifice, which was faith, obedience, and blood. Part of that obedience and faith is our tithing. That's how we carry out our faith. <clears throat> and part of our devotion and our love is our offering. Come back and preach about that some other time. Tithing was already way before the law. And then we saw where Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. And we see again where Jacob, out of his faith and his devotion to God, when he picked his head up off of that rock at Bethel, where he saw the angels ascending and descending from the throne of God, and he made this vow to God that he'd heard his father make and that he'd heard his grandfather make. And more than likely at the time that, that Jacob is laying his head on that pillar, Abraham is still alive. If you do the chronology there. So he saw his grandpa's faithfulness to God. And he saw his father's faithfulness to God. Hey, Son of God, don't let your children see your unfaithfulness to God. It's okay for them to see your mistakes, but it's not okay for them to see your unfaithfulness. Oh, I'm preaching right now. I may not be screaming, but I'm telling you, it's okay for them because you're not going to be perfect, but you can be faithful. I said you're not going to be perfect, but you can be faithful. You're probably going to scream at your wife one time in your life. It'll be the last time you do it, but you'll do it at least one time. <laughs> What's the old saying? Somebody said it's Bible. No, it's not Bible, but you almost think it is. Hell hath no fury. Like a woman scorned. You might yell at your husband. You might kick the dog. But I want to tell you something. 
Don't let your kids see unfaithfulness. Don't let them see you making stupid excuses on why you're missing church. Thank you for that one person that clapped their hands and agreed with me. I, if you're waiting for me to back up, I'm not backing up, brothers and sisters. We're living in a day and age where all of a sudden Satan has really tried to marginalize how important it is to go into church. But I'll tell you this, the Weight Watchers know how important it is to go to the Weight Watchers meeting. And Alcohol Anonymous knows how important it is to go to Alcohol Anonymous meeting. And the drug pusher knows how important it is for you to meet him every Tuesday and pay him to get your drug money. Satan understands the power of faithfulness. I wish God's people would get a fresh revelation of how how powerful faithfulness is in our life. You want to have faith? Then be faithful. You invest in faith by being faithful. That is the seed of faithfulness. That's how faith comes to your life is by being faithful. And so... Jacob saw the faithfulness of his grandfather. He saw the faithfulness of his father. Did they mess up? Oh, yeah. He saw, well, I don't know if he, I don't know if he saw this, but his grandpa lied to Pharaoh. No. Uh, the, the, the king of, of, of Shechem. What was his name? But his, his dad lied to Pharaoh. Same lie. Because both of them married knockout women. It's the one that my wife descended from. Thank God I haven't had to lie to keep her in my life. But pray for me, brothers and sisters. She's still such a beautiful woman. I may have to fight that temptation one day. Tithing was under the law. The law of Moses stipulated that what, when, and where, and how tithing in the tithing of crops from the land. If a part was redeemed to pay cash... One-fifth of the value is added when counting cattle, oxen, or sheep. The tenth animal to pass under the rod was given to the Levites. Leviticus 27, verse 30 through 34. Let's look at this. Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. Do you know how to read? You know where to find that in your Bible? He told me he's called to preach, so I'm, I'm working on him. And all the tithes of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It's holy unto the Lord. You got it? Okay, the next verse. And if a man will at all redeem out of his tithes, he shall add there, thereto the fifth part thereof. Next verse. And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. Now you don't see this a lot anymore, but growing up, my father had people in the church that they would they would pay their tithe off of their deer that they shot. They would pay the tithe off of the cows that they slaughtered. We even had people in our church that paid tithe off of their welfare checks. They couldn't give money, so they would go buy groceries and they'd give them to my family. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. I still think that commodity cheese is the best stuff you ever ate. Don't be knocking that stuff. That was good cheese. And what's so amazing is I watch God bless those people. I watch God bless those people. I'm thinking of one lady now. She's in her 80s right now, and I don't know how many houses she owns. And her husband was killed in a terrible accident, burn up in a fire. But that woman was so faithful to God. And to this day, she was faithful to God, worked hard. And her husband never lived for God. He was a good man, but he never lived for God. But I watched the faithfulness of this woman, God, take her out of what some people would have termed abject poverty. And, and God put her in a position where it's just unbelievable today. And she's still very faithful and lives for God to this day. 
So here's a question that's also asked. If I get behind on my tithing, do I pay a fifth extra 20% more because of this scripture says it and, and there is there is always a question whether a person was fully paying the amount due to the Lord. I've included every recorded instance where God required additional 20% added to the principal. And here they are. Are you ready for them? A man sinning in ignorance concerning holy things was to bring a ram as a trespass offering. This type of sin offering required the offender to add one fit to it. Leviticus 5, 14 through 16. When someone lied about what he found or deceived his neighbor in a matter of trust, he had to make restitution and add one fifth. Leviticus 6, 1 through 6. This passage covers property in trust, property in partnership, stolen property, property obtained through deceit, and lost property. Or if in ignorance a person ate of the holy things belonging only to the priesthood, he had to restore the items with one-fifth more added to it. So we have five interrelated matters concerning redeeming, buying back things that are covered in Leviticus 27, 1 through 34. When this was done, God required one-fifth to be added to the principle. Redeeming an animal designated for sacrifice. That's why I say that Jephthah made a dumb mistake. He could have redeemed that daughter. But he didn't know the word of God. That's why some of you better learn the word of God. You'll make dumb mistakes if you don't know the word of God. Redeeming the house offered to God. Buying back a field offered to God. Redeeming a firstborn unclean animal. Or redeeming seed or fruit. In Numbers 5, 5 through 10, we find similar situations as in point. Uh, in fact, let's read, let's read Numbers chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. Numbers chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying... Speak unto the children of Israel when a man or a woman shall commit any sin that men commit to do a trespass against the Lord and that person be guilty then they shall confess their sin which they have done and he shall recompense his trespass, his trespass excuse me with the principle thereof and add to it the fifth part. Now this principle look at this closely this is not his tithing this is his sin offering and he's supposed to add 20% to the sin offering however he did that. And give it unto him against whom he hath trespassed. Okay, but if a man have no kinsman to recompense the trespass unto, let the trespass be recompensed unto the Lord, even to the priest besides the ram of the atonement, whereby an atonement shall be made for him. So he, he, he is paying for a sin against a brother or a sister. All right? So... I do not believe God did not, nor does he now require people to pay 20% penalty on tithes not paid on time. In the instances above, a question of full payment or fair payment is the object of discussion not being laid on the payment. God instituted these rules under the laws as a matter of fairness to the offender and to the work of God. These are business transactions. This is not talking about the tithing of God to these people. So if you're late on your tithing, for God's sake, just write a check tonight and go on and say, okay, God, I'm not going to do that anymore. Man, y'all are quiet. I thought you'd be running the aisles by now. This is good teaching. Tithes were, were paid in the place God designated. Not anywhere in Israel where people wanted to pay them. Tithing was paid in a designated area to the Levites. Now we know, and we talked about this last night, that the Levites did not have a particular area and so it becomes ambiguous when they go into captivity. Where did the Levites go? Well, the Levites went where they always went. They were among the people of God. There were six cities that were given as cities of refuge, and this was really the only inheritance that the Levites had. And so they were in these cities, and they ministered. And so all of these people, if they could not get to Jerusalem, they would go to these cities, and they would pay their tithe in those cities to the Levites. Israel had been robbing God of tithes and offering, and a curse was upon them. God promised them a blessing if they would obey his word. We already read that. 
And then apparently every three years a special tithe in the Old Testament law was given to help uh, unfortunate people. We'll come back and we'll talk about the law of the stranger because some of you need to learn that in your life. You are just, I mean, you account for every penny. That's good in some areas, but in some areas you need to leave the corners of the field unglean, un, un, uncut. Leave them out there. And if you accidentally drop a $20 bill and you see somebody pick it up, don't turn around and scream at them and say, that's my money. Let them have it. God's blessed you. There'll come a day when you'll spend $20 like you did two cents for a piece of bubble gum many years ago. That day is today. You pay that much in Starbucks for you and your wife. I'm not getting too many amens around here, but if some of you ever get these principles, I'm coming against a big, fat, red, slobbering, fang-toothed devil in Pueblo that has robbed so many people of the blessings of God. And I'm going to tell you something. Some people around here are already getting revelation, and I'm hoping these young men and these young ladies get a hold of this principle. If you'll get a hold of it now, you won't have to go through the heartache that your dad and your mom went through because somebody put it in their head. You don't have to pay your tithes. That's just that preacher wanting money. Isn't that amazing? They don't say that about uh, what's the quarterback for uh, Patrick Mahomes. He's making $500 million driving a new car every week. And they're not saying, I ain't giving my money to that kid. Well, they might be if they're Pittsburgh Steelers fans. It's all in how you see the kingdom of God. Praise God. So under grace, scribes and Pharisees believed in paying tithes, and Jesus commended them for this practice. We already quoted this. He said, you pay tithe on uh, mint coming in an ice and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. He wasn't telling them not to pay their tithes. He was telling them to keep on paying their tithes, but also to show mercy, which they did not do. And they, they hated the truth of Jesus Christ, and they hated his justice, uh, but they were very... They were very accurate. Jesus did not discourage them. He just continued. He just encouraged them to do all of the law. Abraham paid tithes, Genesis 14 and 20. Those who are of faith are the children of Abraham, Galatians 3 and 7. If we are the children of Abraham, then we will do the works of Abraham, John 8, 39. Let's look at all of these. Brother Richard, if you'll come, uh, there's no way I'll get through all of this lesson tonight. I should because this is all the way through the Bible. I should do this. But in, in Genesis 14 and 20, the Bible says that Abraham paid tithes. And he, Abraham, gave him Melchizedek tithes of all. And we see this again in Galatians 3 and 7. So those that are of faith are the children. That's why I keep telling you and over and over and over, tithing is not a money issue. Tithing is a faith issue. Genesis, or excuse me, Galatians 3 and 7, know you therefore that they which are of faith, they which are of faith, they which are of faith are, what? The children of Abraham. And so this is so important that we see this. Praise God. And then we see again that the children of Abraham will do the works of Abraham in St. John chapter 8, verse number 39. St. John chapter 8, you got it, bub? Well, you've been bragging about your brand new Bible. You better learn how to use it. Got it? Hurry up. You, you, you cost to me my time for preaching. They answered and said unto him, Abram is our father. Abraham is I'll our put father. Put some gusto in it. You read like you're reading in front of your mom at school. <laughs> Jesus said unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. So don't brag about being a Christian. And you're not paying your tithes. Put 
Paul gave an outstanding exposition. I wish I had time to deal with this in, dis, in, in detail regarding the financial support of the ministry. Somebody said, tithing's not in the t- New Testament. Tithing's all over the New Testament, brothers and sisters. When people talk to you like that, you just shake your head and say, God, heal them of their ignorance. They're not reading their Bible. They're reading AI. They've got chat, GDP, QRAST, or whatever that is. Some of you caught that. Some of you didn't. (laughs) Uh, You're supposed to have the scripture up here. Praise God. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 1 through 14. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have, not, have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yea, doubtless I am unto you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Those are powerful statements that he's making to the church at Corinth. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Because there were people in the church of Corinth that said, we're not paying our tithe to you. We don't have to pay our tithes to you. We're of Apollos. We're of Peter. So Paul is straightening this out as the bishop and the pastor of this church. He said, "Have have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord. And Cephas, he, he, obviously he wasn't married here, but he said, I could have a wife if I wanted, like Peter and like the, the very stepbrothers of Jesus is what he's talking about here. Or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working. I know we're working. We're making tents right now. But he's telling them at Corinth, I don't have to work. Who goeth, to, who goeth to warfare any time at his own charges? Anybody want to go fight for Uncle Sam and not get paid? I don't want to fight for Uncle Sam or Aunt Susie and not get paid. And so he's talking about the ministry and how God takes care of his ministry. Who goeth to warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth the vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth the flock and eateth not the milk of the flock? He's telling Corinth, you are my work. And he said, say I these things as a man or saith not the law the same also. So Paul refers back to the law and brings it into the New Testament. And look what he uses here in the law. For it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. And then he makes it very clear. God is not talking about oxen here. He's not talking about oxen. Okay, verse number 10. Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope. And he that thresheth, thresheth in hope and should be partakers of this hope. This is why I have a problem with you paying your tithes somewhere else other than where you're going to church. It's not biblical. And people pay their tithes to some televangelist or some friend of theirs. Brother Elder, do you pay tithes? I sure do. I pay them right here in this church where they belong. It's what we use to have revival. A lot more. God forbid that I preach something to you that I don't practice. If we've sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Paul is very clear about this. If others be takers, uh, partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we've not used this power, but suffer all things lest we should hinder the gospel of, of Christ. And so he explains to them why he is not taking their tithing. He's taking their tithing. He's just not living of it. Praise God. Well, let's clap our hands.
Now we know that the Apostle Paul was a tent maker. We know that he was. You've heard me preach one of the greatest messages God's ever given me about the church at Ephesus. I love, there's such revelatory power. And I, how long have I been going? Somebody timing me. I forgot to set my timer tonight. I didn't want to go over an hour and 45 minutes. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> You should have heard the groans I heard up here. <laughs> he did make tents and he did support himself, but he was also supported by the church. He, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7 through 13, the Bible bears this out. Let's look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7 through 13. The Bible tells us, have I committed an offense in abasing myself that she might be exalted because I preached to you the gospel of, of God freely? Now, some of you think that he's just talking about freely. No, he's saying, I didn't charge the church at Corinth. I didn't take the tithing. But he didn't stop there. He says, I, and this is a mistranslation. I looked this up tonight because I thought, sometimes Mr. Mr. Uh, Tyndale really struggled to get the right words in the English. Someday, I would love to teach a class in this church on how powerful Tyndale has influenced the whole English language. We still use phrases that he coined out of the Bible. In fact, you, you've heard the expression, the uh, uh, Shakespearean English. Well, Shakespearean English is Tyndale English. William Tyndale, the first English Bible. And he actually used a wrong word here, and I think I have it here. I was looking at these notes tonight, and I did have it. Uh, and, of course, this messed up too. Uh, but the word here actually means that I used it for myself. It's not, I robbed other people. You'd have to find the scripture, son, and, and click on the, is the scripture there? He said, but, uh, uh, where's it at? Verse 8, I robbed other churches, and that is the word saluo, which literally is from two different words. One word is harema, I guess, I don't know how to pronounce it. And it literally means to take for oneself. And so he said, from other churches paying their tithe, remember Paul pastored, I don't know how many churches. He said, from those other churches, I took tithing so that I didn't have to take it from you. I'll tell you this, okay? I'm going to tell you this openly. Y'all still with me? You still interested in this? Good. I hope you are. I hope you young people are getting this because if you get this, if you get this principle and you realize if, if I will do this God's way, he will bless me abundantly. And so uh, when, when I took the work in Greeley, there was a good man that was there. He did an awesome job. And God called him on to do other things. But one of the mistakes that he was making is he would not take any tithing from that church. And I told him, I told him before he left, I said, if you want God to bless those people, you start taking, I don't care if it's $50 a week. You, you can determine what you take, but you do not realize that he was literally robbing the blessing of God from that church. And, and he didn't do it intentionally. He did it out of his love for his church. And this is what Paul was doing. I'm going to show you here in a minute where Paul apologized to the church of Corinth. Because he robbed them of the blessings of God. Because God ties that to the ministry. I have to stand before God and give an account for your soul. Hebrews, what is it? Hebrews chapter uh, where it says to, uh, to obey them which have a rule. Is that Hebrews 13? 7? 17? Hebrews 13, 17. Obey them which have the rule over you. For they watch for your soul as one that must give an account your soul did I get the reference right uh, 
uh, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For this is, look at the word unprofitable. It's connected, brothers and sisters. All of this is connected. It's unprofitable for you if what is giving an account? You have to give an account of what is given into the church. You say, well, I'm faithful to God. I go to church every Sunday. Yeah, but are you doing what God said? Are you supporting that local church? Well, I'm giving an offering. Yeah, but you're not accountable to that pastor. I've even had people tell me, well, you're not my pastor. I've had people in this church, well, you're not my pastor. And then I tell them, well, what are you doing coming to this church if I'm not your pastor? You know, I'm going to tell you something. I love Katrina and Matt Wise more than they will ever know in this family. And I would love to tell them, now you go down there, but I'm still your pastor. (laughs) You and I are laughing because that's the dumbest thing you ever heard of. How far is El Paso from here? It's a thousand miles. And all I can do is I pray, okay, God, these are wonderful people. I've got to hand them off because for God to bless them, they've got to be a part of that body. They've got to be a part of that body. Now, I'm praying they come back up here. But you know what? Only God and Uncle Sam can take care of that. Now, that was a great illustration of what I'm trying to... I, I th- thank you all for coming tonight. Appreciate that. You didn't know it. You're right in the will of God. <laughs> so, so, so what are you saying, Brother Elder? I'm saying that I have to give an account as a man of God, and I want to do it with joy, not with grief. I don't want to do this ignorantly. I don't want to hurt people that I'm trying to show my love for them. I've done that before. And I promise God I'll never do it again. I will tell the truth no matter how much it hurts you. You said, Brother Elder, have you not told the truth? Yeah, I have. Well, kind of. It's none of your business how it happened, but it happened. And I've regretted every day that I love somebody so much that I didn't tell them the truth. You just got to take it as it is. I know I'm a little over time tonight, but I feel the Holy Ghost pushing me to teach this. Let's clap our hands to him and praise him again. And so we see in in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 7, let's look at this. We already read this. Have I committed when I was present with to do kill me (laughs) seven verse seven have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely I robbed other churches taking wages of them to do you service is what he says and then verse number nine and when I was present with you and wanted I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me. The brethren which came from Macedonia supplied, and in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. Verse number, uh, uh, let's go on. Verse number 10. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia, Wherefore, because I love you, not God knoweth. Praise God. And then we have later on where he says that he apologizes to them in not taking support from them. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 13. You ever notice how we really get deep into the word of God and Boy, the devil does not like us learning this stuff. 2 Corinthians 11, For such are false apostles, deceitfully working, transforming themselves into angels. Did 
I get that right? 2 Corinthians 12, 13. For what is it wherein you were inferior to other churches except that it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Look at this, brothers and sisters. He says, forgive me for doing this to you, Corinth. I was wrong. I robbed the blessings of God out of your life. Now, I have a jillion other notes tonight, but I think the important thing of preaching is to declare the word of the Lord. and To communicate the voice of God to His children. And so, since you're my, are you my uh, cadet tonight? So you get to get picked on. And so, Brother Isaac, I'm really not picking on you, son. If you can get this in your heart, where somebody flippantly, just nonchalantly throws you a quarter and you carefully say, three cents of that belongs to God because I don't know how you can cut a penny in half. And I always round up because God's been good to me. If you can get this, Isaac. I knew a man one time couldn't quit cigarettes. He couldn't stop smoking. He preached about it. Brother Lonnie Marcus, incredible man of God. He was so ashamed of his addiction that he wouldn't even go to church. But he sent his tithing with his mama to church. And he told her, Mama, maybe God will see this and deliver me. And guess what? God not only delivered him, God filled him full of the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name, and he built an incredible church in the Dallas-Fort Worth area because this breaks bondages. It's not money, brothers and sisters. It's faith. It's obedience to God. It's doing things in God's order. And I cannot describe to you the power that comes to you through your alignment with the, the order of God. Let's stand to our feet tonight. I want us to lift our hands. Now there's there's young men here. While you're praying, I'm, I'm going to talk to you. There's young men here that you don't even know it, young man, but you're breaking curses in your family. You don't even realize it. You're breaking curses in your family. And you don't need to be intimidated. You may have family members that tell you, well, I don't think it's necessary. You don't have to argue with them. You, you can still keep praying with your hands raised. I, I mean, you know, after all, you've only had them up for three seconds. And you're breaking family curses in your life. And you don't even realize it. Because you say, Brother Elder, I don't know how that's a connection. I can't explain to you, young man and young lady, God's ways. Because he'll tell you to push a button over here. And it seems like it's so disconnected from what's going on in your life over here. But when you push that button over here. All kinds of miracles and order and, and the things in your life just fall into place like God wants them over here. I feel the Holy Ghost while I'm preaching this tonight. I'm not preaching this because, you know, whatever. All of the normal excuses that the devil tell you, the reason why I got to preach this. I'll tell you why I'm preaching this. Because I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. And I want to see the blessings of God in your life. I want you to, there, there's, there's young men in this church that are going to buy houses that nobody in their family has ever owned their own house before. They've rented, they've been in projects, but they're going to do this and they're going to submit themselves to God and they're going to break that curse and they're going to come out of that. They're going to come out of that with what, whatever the will of God college degrees and businesses uh, and leaders in the community because they realized they saw the connection between the blessing of God and the obedience to the word of God young ladies that 
every one of them, including their mom, was pregnant before 16 years of age. And here you are in church tonight, young lady, and, and, and here God is blessing you. I want to put these projects in Pueblo out of business. They're nothing but a seedbed of perversion and drug addiction and screaming and violence and sexual molestation. But I'm believing God that there'll be young ladies in this church that'll come out of that and say, you did that to my mama. You did that to my daddy. You did that to my grandma. You did that to my aunt. You did that to my great grandma. But you ain't doing that to me because I'm going to obey the word of God. I'm coming out of this. God, you're going to break this curse in my family's life. You're going to bring deliverance. You're going you're to do stuff in my life. Oh, we like to preach about the Davids and we like to preach about all of them. But what about the Ruths? What about the Rahabs? What about Mary, the mother of Jesus? There's ministry for our ladies too. Let's lift our hands and let's worship him again. Hallelujah. Come on, let's worship him. We love you. We praise you, Jesus. We love you. We thank you, oh God. We're so honored to be in your presence, Lord. We're so thankful tonight. So thankful for the moving of the Holy Ghost in this house. So thankful for these brothers and sisters that that loved you so much, so devoted that they're here tonight, oh God. I pray, oh God, that your hand would be upon your people tonight. Would you help me pray, church? Let us get it. Let us get it down in our spirit and in our soul, God. Let these young men and these young ladies get it. Let the husbands and the wives that are here tonight get it, oh God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God, we're so grateful for another Wednesday night service. Tuesday night service. Wednesday night in Greeley. Thank you for the moving of the Holy Ghost here, God. Thank you for the power invested in your people to change, to become who you've called us to become. Let this word find fertile soil tonight, God. Let it find fertile soil. Let your word be honored, obeyed, and planted, and invested in our lives. Jesus, let it bring forth fruit, much fruit, not just in our lives, but in our children's lives, in our marriages, in our grandchildren's lives, in the future the whole namesake of our families oh God as you did Abraham you want to do that with our families oh God so I pray that we get this revelation because we are Abraham's children through the cross of Jesus Christ we pray all of this in the name of Jesus and everybody said in Jesus name God bless you you can be dismissed or seated whichever one you choose